Hello, my name is Dr. Sharif Leib. I'm a professor of, uh, in the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology. And today I will be talking to you about development of the genital organs and their abnormalities. Uh, there are two different things, sex determination and sex differentiation. Of course, the sex, as we all know, uh, is determined at the time of fertilization, while sex differentiation is a different thing, and this starts at the sixth week and is completed late in the fifth month. The sex development includes development of the gonads, development of the internal genitalia, and development of the external uh, genitalia. Uh, what are the embryological sources of these components? The urogenital ridge gives rise to the gonads, which are either male or female. The Wolfian duct will form the male internal genitalia. The Mullerian duct will form the female internal genitalia. And the urogenital sinus will form the external genitalia, whether male or female. So how does gonadal development develop? And this usually starts early at around six weeks. Then different gonad is formed of a cortex, which is formed of mesenchymal tissue, and the medulla, which is also formed of mesenchymal tissue. And some primitive cells around it, which form the sex cord cells, and this is usually covered by ceramic epithelium. The primordial cells, these usually migrate from the second New York sac towards the developing gonad, and subsequent differentiation depends upon the presence or absence of the sex hormones. However, autosomes are also important, as we'll see in the following slides. So, how does testicular differentiation happen? In males, the Y chromosome contains something known as the testis determining gene, which is the HY and contains the HY antigen, and this is responsible for testicular differentiation. So, testicular differentiation usually starts at seven weeks, and in this case, the sex cords and the germ cells migrate into the medulla and as a result the medulla of this primitive gonad expands at the expense of the cortex and the germ cells later on form the spermatogonia and the sex cord cells will form the sertoli cells some mesodermal cells will form resulting in lydic cells so we'll have sertoli cells and we'll have lydic cells the sertoli cells will produce the anti-mullerian hormone and the lydic cells will produce testosterone. In the females, the ovarian differentiation is different. Uh, the, there is no Y chromosome and therefore there is no HY antigen and this results by default in ovarian differentiation. The cortex dominates while the medulla shrinks, called the hilum in this case, and contains hilar cells and the primordial germ cells from the yolk sac will form orgonia and these are the primary oocytes. The sex cord cells, they surround the primary oocytes to form the primordial cells. In third, certain conditions such as Turner's syndromes, the oocytes are not surrounded by these sex cord cells and they will undergo premature atresia resulting in primary uh, amenorrhea. And you can see from the schematic diagram the level uh, of the path of migration. This is the uh, uh, migration of the primitive germ cells as they uh, migrate from the yolk sac into uh, the uh, uh, site of the primitive uh, gonad. Uh, we'll talk again about the ovarian development. The genital ridge is present at the 10th to 11th thoracic segment, while uh, the developed ovaries are in the pelvis. Later on, the ovaries descend by the gubernaculum until they reach the lower part of the pelvis. Uh, the the gubernaculum is a fibromuscular band which runs in the equinal canal, becomes shorter, pulling the ovary down into the pelvis, and becomes attached to the uterus, giving two ligaments the ovarian ligament posteriorly and the round ligament anteriorly. Uh, the development of the internal genitalia uh, in the different stages, there are two tubes lateral to the gonads on either side the Wolfen, or Wolfian or the mesonephric duct. And this is responsible for the development of the male internal genitalia and the Mullerian or paramesonephric duct, which is responsible for the female internal uh, genitalia. And you can see here, next to the primitive gonad, you can see here the kidneys, and you can see the gonad here in the schematic diagram, and you can see the mesonephric and the paramesonephric uh, ducts. How do the male internal genitalia develop? Remember that in order for uh, an individual to develop into a male, this is an active process. 
that what requires the presence of testosterone. So the testicular sertoli cells, as we said before, they secrete the anti-mullerian hormone or mullerian duct inhibiting factor, and this is very important for the atrophy of the mullerian duct. If an individual does not have anti-mullerian hormone, he will develop a uterus inside. The testicular testosterone, this is important for the Wolfian duct development, resulting in the male internal genitalia, resulting in vas deferens and seminal vesicle development. And as we said, the effects of the malarian duct inhibiting factor, or anti-malarian hormone, and testosterone is local, affecting the side of the secreting gonad only. That means if they have only one testicle on one side, only the, this side will have normal uh, male internal genitalia development. The female internal genitalia, as we said, this is a passive process. So in this case, we have no Sertoli cells. There is no Mullerian duct inhibiting factor, and this allows the Mullerian ducts to develop. And because this individual does not have testosterone produced by the uh, Leydig cells, the Wolfian ducts will not develop and will atrophy, resulting in remnants. Uh, how will the Mullerian duct develop? The upper part, or the cephalic part, of each malarian duct will form the fallopian tube and these will remain unfused while the, malaria, the malarian ducts will fuse in the lower part forming the uterus and the cervix and the upper four-fifth of the vagina. While the lower part of the vagina usually develops from the urogenital sinus. Here you can see from the schematic diagram, this is the malarian duct, you can see one on either side. The upper parts remain unfused forming the tubes while the lower part fuse together and usually start fusing from below upwards resulting in a fused uterus and a fused cervix and a fused vaginal canal the upper fourth-fifth of the vagina or the lower one-fifth uh, of the vagina is formed from the urogenital sinus How about the remnants of the Wolfian duct? The remnants of the Wolfian duct due to the absence of testosterone they sometimes form remnants in the broad ligament known as the epoophoron and hydrated cysts uh, of Morgagni and the paraophoron, which are small um, uh, vestigial uh, tubules that sometimes we can find in the broad uh, ligament. And sometimes also you can find a Gardner duct, which may sometimes form a cyst uh, in the inguinal region in the female. This is a vestigial remnant of the uh, Wolfian system. The external genitalia, uh, as we said before, in the absence of testosterone, uh, the, the fault development is along female lines. So if you don't have testosterone, the external genitalia will develop into female external genitalia. In order for male external genitalia to develop, this is an active process that requires an active uh, process, the presence of testosterone, and secondly, that the tissue themselves is sensitive to this testosterone. So, uh, the primitive, undifferentiated external genitalia, we have a median pair of swellings known as genital folds, a lateral pair of swellings known as genital swellings, and the central swelling known as the genital uh, tubercle. Here you can see them, the genital tubercle in the middle, and the genital folds centrally and peripherally can have the genital swellings. So, how uh, the, does the male development happen? Because of the presence of testosterone, the external genitalia develops into male external uh, genitalia. The genital tubercle enlarges to form the penis. Gen 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 uh, the genital folds fuse together, forming the penile part of the male urethra, while the genital swellings will enlarge and fuse to form the scrotum, as you can see from this diagram. So you can see the genital tubercle enlarging to form the penis, the genital folds forming the, the uh, the penile urethra and the genital swellings, uh, genital uh, swellings laterally forming the uh, the, um, uh, the the scrotum. Female external genitalia is a passive process and it occurs in the absence of androgens. So if you don't have androgens for whatever reason, even if this individual is a genetic male and it is for some. Uh, reasons such as in cases of androgen insensitivity syndrome, their external genitalia are not sensitive to uh, androgens, they will also have female external genitalia. But normal female external
it's gener genitalia because they do not have genetically uh, a Y chromosome and phenotypically they don't have uh, Sertoli or Leydig cells, they have normal ovaries uh, due to the absence of androgens. The genital tubercle will form the clitoris, the genital folds will form the labia minora and the genital swellings will enlarge to form the unfused labia majora. Here you can see the difference between the male and female uh, the development. You can see that this is the female. You can see the clitoris, the labia minora and the labia majora both unfused, unlike the male in which the, labia, the genital uh, folds fuse to form the penile urethra and the genital swellings laterally fuse also to form the uh, scrotum. So what are the developmental abnormalities? The first thing is that the ovary does not form at all. This is known as a plasia that is extremely rare and this leads to a false hypogonadotropic, uh, hypogonadotropic hypogonadism in which there is elevated levels of FSH and NH but there is no ovary so there is failure of secondary sexual development and primary uh, amenorrhea. Hypoplasia or ovarian underdevelopment this leads also to amenorrhea, oligomenorrhea or hypomenorrhea. Street gonads, uh, this is ovarian dysgenesis, this occurs in individuals with only one X chromosomes, such as in cases of Turner's syndrome. The ovaries here are represented by connective tissue leading to uh, not delayed puberty but actually primary uh, amenorrhea. Uh, the tubes, usually they, the, the, the development uh, follows the development of the uterus. Very rarely we have abnormalities in the tubes without that being reflected in abnormalities in the uterus. So we have aplasia, hypoplasia, accessory estium or tubal diverticulum, but these are very rare abnormalities to be found in isolation without the abnormalities in the uterus. Uh, the uterine anomalies are more common and these include um, uh, proper uh, Mullerian development such as aplasia in which the uterus does not form or is uh, completely absent, something known as uh, mayer kotansky kosterhausen syndrome. This is associated with absence of the tubes and the upper four-fifths of the vagina which is known as Mullerian agenesis. Hypoplasia in which the uterus is very small and solid structure or even infantile with a body to cervix ratio of one to two. Uh, uterine, uh, sometimes you have also fusion abnormalities, as we said, the Mullerian uh, or the uterus develops from two Mullerian or paramesionephric ducts that fuse together in the middle line. Sometimes there is failure of this fusion, resulting in fusion abnormalities. Uh, sometimes you have complete failure of fusion, resulting in uterus didelphus, in which you have two separate uteri, two bodies and two services, uh, with two separate vagina with a longitudinal septum. Uterus bicornus bicollis, in which you have two uteri, two bodies, and two surfaces, and one vagina. A uterus bicornus and uh, bicornus unicornus, in which you have two uteri, or bodies, one cervix, and one vagina, depending on the degree of failure of fusion. Uh, after fusion, there is usually resorption of the septum between the two malarian ducts resulting in formation of a single uterine cavity. Sometimes this fails, resulting in various degree of uh, 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 septum formation. Uh, there is either complete failure of resorption, these are known as resorption disorders. If the septum is completely uh, unresorbed, this results in a subseptate subtate uh, uterus in which you have one uterus which is divided completely in the middle into two cavities. Sometimes this division is incomplete, not really reaching the internal loss, some leading to something known as a, by a subseptate uterus. And sometimes there is a, a very, very small fundal indentation. This is known as an arcuate uterus. So all these depend upon the degree of failure uh, of resorption of the septum uh, that is usually present between the two uh, parameters, ronephric or modarian ducts. Uh, also, there is uh, sometimes failure formation of one of the horns, resulting in a rudimentary horn and a normal development of one side, resulting in something known as a uterus unicornis, in which you have one only modarian duct developed and the other one is atrophic. And here you can see 
the American Fertility Society classification of various Mullerian abnormalities. Uh, the first one here, this is the normal looking uterus. You can see the normal cavity and it appears triangular in shape and the single uterus. Here you can see a subseptate uterus. You can see the small fundal indentation. This is due to failure of resorption, partial resorption of the septum between the two primary mesonephric ducts. Here you can see an arcuate uterus in which there is a very small fundal indentation. Here you can see a bicornate uterus in which the two horns joined together but incompletely, resulting in fusion in the lower part but failure of fusion in the upper part, resulting in a bicornate uterus. And here you can see a more dramatic form in which there is complete failure of fusion, resulting in two separate uterine cavities, and two separate services and two separate vaginas, something known as a uterus didentus. And here is another example in which only one mesonephric uh, or paramesonephric, sorry, or malarian duct developed, resulting in a unicornate uterus, while the other side resulting in a athletic or a rudimentary uh, non-functioning horn. The clinical presentation, of course, will depend upon the abnormality present. Uh, if you have uh, if the patient doesn't have a uterus at all, of course, she has primary amenorrhea. If the uterus is small but functional, sometimes she has, the patient has infertility or habitual miscarriage. If there is cervical incompetence, the patient may complain of recurrent uh, miscarriage. Uh, sometimes, rarely, if the patient has a bicornate uterus or an identific uterus because of the increased uh, surface area of the endometrium, they may suffer from menorrhagia, although this is not very common. Spasmodic dysmenorrhea may occur in patients that have a functioning but obstructed uh, hemicavity, such as in patients that have a, a unicornate uterus with a non-communicating but functioning horn. In this case, they will have regular menses from the functioning uh, side, while the non-communicating functioning horn will have blood trapped inside it, resulting in severe spasmodic dysmenorrhea uh, every month. Patients that have a septum, such as septate uterus, or a completely divided uterus such as bicornate uterus, uh, will, this will hamper uh, internal rotation of the fetus resulting in higher incidence of uh, malpresentation. Uh, the aplasia of the vagina, uh, as we said before, this is uh, uh, an abnormality that will, that will result in primary amnorrhea, but this is usually a case of Cryptomenorrhea because if the patient has a vagina but uh, doesn't have a vagina but has normal functioning uterus and cervix, the, the blood will be trapped inside the uterus, resulting in cryptomenorrhea and severe dysmenorrhea uh, at uh, the time of menses. More commonly, patients that have a vaginal aplasia also have aplasia of also the uterus and the cervix, so they usually have primary amenorrhea at puberty, and of course, these, uh, these don't have any chance of achieving uh, pregnancy. Uh, if they want to have sexual relations and get married, then they have to develop a vagina, either by the use of uh, successively larger uh, vaginal dilators, or if this is not successful, by an operation to create an artificial vagina, something known as a McIndoe uh, operation. If the patient has a transverse vaginal septum with functioning Mullerian ducts, uh, then uh, she will have primary amenorrhea but with severe dysmenorrhea <coughs> and this is usually treated by uh, surgical excision uh, of the septum in order to allow for the normal escape of the menstrual uh, blood. Uh, if she has an imperforate hymen, this is also similar to a transverse vaginal septum. In this case, the patient will have primary amenorrhea uh, uh, because of the obstruction of the outflow. It's actually known as a false amenorrhea or cryptomenorrhea because the uterus and the vagina and the hypothyroid between the ovarian axis are functioning as normal. So if the patient is having her normal cycles, but the, the menstrual blood is concealed because of the presence of the imperforate hymen, and this can be treated by a simple cruciate incision to uh, uh, open the uh, uh, imperforate hymen. A longitudinal vaginal septum can sometimes be discovered accidentally because the patient is usually has, uh, not complaining of any 
problems until she becomes married and in such case he may complain of the uh, dyspareunia uh, if it is isolated and this can be treated by surgical excision uh, of the septum. Uh, lastly we'll talk about female genital mutilation. Uh, female genital mutilation also known as female genital cutting. This refers to all procedures involving partial or total removal of external genitalia or other injury to female genital organs for non-medical reasons. <coughs> it is practiced for a variety of complex reasons, usually in the belief that it is beneficial for the girl. It has no health benefits and harms girls as well as women in many ways. Female genital mutilation is a human rights violation and a form of child abuse reaching the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child and is a severe form of violence against women and girls. There are several types depending on the part of the world in which it is practiced. Type 1 in, there, in which there is partial or total removal of the clitoris and or the pepis that is known as clitoridectomy. This is the mildest form. Type 2 which is more severe in which there is partial or total removal of the clitoris in addition to the labia minora with or without the excision of the labia majora. And type 3 this is a more severe form in which there is narrowing of the vaginal orifice with creation of a covering seal by cutting the opposing labia minora and or labia majora with or without excision uh, of the clitoris, such as some, uh, something known as in uh, fabulation. Uh, these are in uh, various degrees of uh, varying degrees of severity. And type 4, all other harmful procedures of the female genitalia for non-medical purposes, for example, pricking or piercing. The complications, of course, short-term which can happen at the time of the procedure, such as hemorrhage, infection, and urine retention, and genital swelling. The long-term complication, genital scar uh, scarring, urine tract complications, such as recurrent urine tract infection, uh, vaginal calculi, also damage to the urethra during female genital mutilation of any type may result in urinary stricture or fistula. They also, after uh, they become sexually active, they have dyspareunia or eparunia and impact uh, sexual function. Psychological sequelae because of the, uh, the procedure itself and its memories and pain. And uh, mental difficulties such as hematocorpus and dysmenorrhea depending on uh, the, the severity of the genital uh, mutilation. Uh, genital infections and pelvic inflammatory disease rarely happen but sometimes infertility, HIV and hepatitis if these procedures are done in a uh, septic uh, condition because they are um, considered to be unlawful in many parts of the world. So they are practiced uh, by uh, non-medical personnel in uh, unhygienic circumstances resulting in the spread of infections, especially HIV and hepatitis. And they may result also in obstetric uh, complications such as uh, birth injuries or uh, obstetric injuries and fistulae because of uh, stenosis and scarring of uh, the vagina and the, the perineal uh, tissue. Thank you.